the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, a collection of the final words from the sons of Jacob, exhorting their sons to walk in truth and in righteousness. Each patriarch has a unique message and perspective to share with the audience, containing unmistakable messianic prophecies and visions of end times revelation and impending judgment. The Testaments reflect some of the highest and noblest ethical teaching available and truly foreshadow many of Messiah's own precepts. The collection was preserved in Greek, Slavonic, Georgian, Serbian, Armenian, Venetian, and Latin. They were included in some canons, such as Armenian Orthodox, and were quoted by and alluded to through prominent early assembly writers, such as Origen and Jerome. Nevertheless, they are speculated by scholars to be pseudepigraphal and perhaps even Christian works. However, the avid researcher may be excited to know that the Dead Sea Scrolls findings included parts of Levi and Naphtali, dating to a minimum of 100 to 200 BC, thus lending credibility to the entire work. While we believe the Testaments to be inspired and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, it is up to you to test them and decide. With that being said, let's study together and show ourselves approved. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Testament of Twelve Patriarchs reading. This is the Testament of Naphtali. We've titled it Body, Spirit, and Truth, but there's actually a lot of different things we're going to talk about in this Testament. A very unique one and I'm really excited to go over it with you today. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, Most High, we just come before you and bless you in Yahushua's name, your glorious Son. Father, we thank you for giving us a, a path of redemption and reconciliation back to you through his blood. Father, we thank you for opening our eyes in these last days to exposing the lies and sharing truth with us and showing us a walk of, well, spirit and truth, Father. And I just pray that eyes and ears would be attentive and open to hearing your words tonight, Father, through the prophet Naphtali. In Yahushua's mighty name, we bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's start with a quick little shofar blast, and then we're going to get right into the Testament of Natali. All right, here we go. We are going to be headed over to www.parablevenue.com. Uh, where we will have the Testament of Naphtali here for you to read free if you would like to read it for yourself. Uh, as we, I think we do have most of them as well up there or working on it. But let's get started. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 1. A copy of the Testament of Naphtali, which he decreed at the time of his death in the 132nd year of his life, when his sons were gathered together in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, and he was in good health, he gave a feast of food and wine. Bible trivia for you all out there. What is the first day of the seventh month? That's right, the Feast of Trumpets. So, this was the Feast of Trumpets, and he gave a feast of food and wine. And that's typically what happens on the Feast of Trumpets. You get together, you have a feast, and you blow shofars and trumpets. It's kind of like the awakening blast of, hey, the day of Yah is near, it's close, wake up. And we rejoice because when that comes, his kingdom comes. So, anyways, uh, let's keep going. After he awoke early the next morning, he told them, I am dying, but they did not believe him. I wonder why. Maybe he seemed to appear in good health. We've talked about this in other uh, books. Uh, I can't remember where we talked about this, but maybe they seemed to have aged a little differently back then. Even though he was 132 years old, they're like, ah, we don't believe you. Maybe he was still in good health, good shape. But anyways, and while he was blessing Yahuwah, he confirmed that after the previous day's feast, he would die. Then he began to say to his sons, Listen, my children, sons of Naphtali, hear your father's words. I was born from Bilhah. Rachel dealt craftily, giving Bilhah to Jacob in place of herself. And she bore me on the knees of Rachel, for which reason she called me Naphtali. Let's go ahead and just read the Genesis account of the birth of Naphtali. Genesis 30, 1 through 8. <clears throat> says this, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. We're going to be talking about envy a little bit later. And yeah, not good stuff. And envied her. Actually, no, sorry. I think we're going to be talking about envy in the Torah portion later tonight. 
Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and said, Am I in Elohim's stead? Who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And she said, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. This is very similar, of course, as we know, with Sarah, the promise was given to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child. Another one was happening, and they're like, well, let's just, let's make this happen ourselves. Here, go into Hagar, and let's, let's, get, let's have this child. <clears throat> and she gave him Bilhah for her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her. And Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, Elohim has judged me and has also heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. And Bilhah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, With great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. So, okay, that was the account. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 1, verse 7. Rachel loved me because I was born in her lap. While I was tender in appearance, she would kiss me and say, May I see a brother of yours like you from my own womb. Thus, Yosef was like me in every way in keeping with Rachel's prayer. But my mother was Bilhah, daughter of Rotheos, Deborah's brother, nurse of Rebekah. She was born the very day on which Rachel was born. Rotheos was of Abraham's tribe, a Chaldean, one who honored Elohim, free and well-born. But he was taken captive and bought by Laban who gave him Yuna, his servant girl, as a wife. She bore a daughter and called her Zilpah from the name of the village in which she had been taken captive. After that, she bore Bilhah, saying, My daughter is ever eager for new, for new things. No sooner had she been born that she hurried to start sucking. So that was the end of chapter one. So <clears throat> for those of you that love the Torah and the history, um, this just gives us some interesting details that we don't get from the canon of who's who, where they came from, their origins, those type of things. So pretty cool stuff. Now we're going to get into the meat of it here in chapter two. Since I was a, since I was swift on my feet like a deer, probably pretty literally here as we're going to read some of these stories, you may be like, wow, what? My father, Jacob, appointed me for all missions and messengers, messages, I'm sorry, and as a deer, he blessed me. So we're going to talk about this. There's lots of uh, passages here that are going to share that he was very swift. Genesis 49, 21, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He gives goodly words. And we're actually going to see that literally here uh, in this testament, gives great words of exhortation, gives great, shares great wisdom and uh, prophesies. So we're going to go over those today. Uh, the, let's see. Oh, I want to share with you the Targums, which is the Aramaic. We're going to read 49, 21 as well in the Targums, which says, what does it say here? <clears throat> Naphtali is a swift messenger, like a hind that runs on the top of the mountains, bringing good tidings. He it was who announced that Yosef was living. He it was who hastens to go to Mitzrayim and bring the contract of the double field in which Esau had no portion. We're actually going to read about that here in the book of Yashar. Um, so just sharing that, like, he literally was fast. I mean, just the fastest. He ran as fast as a deer. Deer run pretty fast. The book of Yashar, we're going to read uh, 54, 33 through 36. If you're not familiar with the book of Jasher, it was mentioned twice in uh, the canon, once in Joshua 10, 13, the other in 2 Samuel 1, 18. It said in both times, are these things not written in the book of Jasher? Some people would say this is not the real book. Upon investigation, myself and many brothers have determined that we do believe this is the book, but not to contend. Jasher 54, 33 through 36. And Judah spoke to his brother Naphtali. And he said unto him, Make haste, go now and number all the streets of Egypt and come and tell me. And Simeon said unto him, Let this thing be a, this, I'm sorry, let not this thing be a trouble to you. Now I will go to the mount and take up a large stone from the mount and level it at everyone in Egypt and kill all that are in it. And by the way, the, the setting of this is the kind of standoff between uh, Joseph and his brothers. This is Joseph right before he reveals himself and he's kind of testing his brothers. In the book of Yashar, we get a much more detailed account of really the test that, that um, Joseph was putting before them. And Joseph heard all these words that his brethren spoke before him, and they did not know that Joseph understood them, for they imagined that he knew not to speak Hebrew. 
And Joseph was greatly afraid at the words of his brethren, lest they should destroy Egypt. And he commanded his son Manasseh, saying, Go now, make haste, and gather unto me all the inhabitants of Egypt, and all the valiant men together, and let them come to me now upon horseback and on foot with all sorts of musical instruments. And Manasseh went and did so. And Naphtali went as Judah had commanded him, for Naphtali was light-footed as one of the swift stags, and he would go upon the ears of corn, and when they would not break under him. This sounds like fantastic things, but I, I gotta tell you, I believe that Abraham and his his sons, his his really near descendants, had this had these powers from Yah, these gifts, and I believe it. I believe it to be true. Uh, going a little bit further down, uh, forty six through fifty nine. This is uh, let's see. Why do I have that here? Oh, it's because it's the wrong chapter. 56. Sorry. Chapter 56, 46 through 59. Oops. All right. This is uh, the death of Jacob. Um, they wanted to bury him. And Esau came and was like, no, this is my stuff. And the report reached Esau saying, Jacob died in Egypt and his sons and all Egypt are conveying him to the land of Canaan to bury him. And Esau heard this thing, and he was dwelling in Mount Seir, and he rose up with his sons and all his people and all his household, a people exceedingly great, and they came to mourn and weep over Jacob. And it came to pass, when Esau came, he mourned for his brother Jacob, and all Egypt and all Canaan ro again rose up and mourned a great mourning with Esau over Jacob in that place. And Yosef and his brethren brought their father Jacob from that place, and they went to Hebron to bury Jacob in the cave by his fathers. And they came unto Kiriath Arba, to the cave, as they came, Esau stood with his sons against Yosef and his brethren as a hindrance to the cave, saying, Jacob shall not be buried therein, for it belongs to us and to our father. And Yosef and his brethren heard the words of Esau's sons, and they were exceedingly wroth. And Yosef approached unto Esau, saying, What is this thing which they have spoken? Surely my father Jacob bought it from you for great riches after the death of Isaac. Now five and twenty years ago, and also all the land of Canaan, he bought from you and from your sons and your seed after you. And Jacob bought it for his sons and for his seeds after him for an inheritance forever. And why do you speak these things this day? And Esau answered, saying, You speak falsely and utter lies, for I sold not anything belonging to me in all the land, as you say. Neither did my brother Jacob buy aught belonging to me in this land. And Esau spoke these things in order to deceive Yosef with his words, for Esau knew that Yosef was not present in those days when Esau sold all belonging to him in the land of Canaan to Jacob. And Yosef said to Esau, Surely my father inserted these things with you in the record of purchase, and testified the record with witnesses, and behold, it is with us in Egypt. And Esau, <clears throat> Esau answered, saying unto him, Bring the record. All that you will find in the record, so will we do. Excuse me. And Yosef called on Naphtali, his brother, and he said, Hasten quickly, stay not, and run, I pray you, to Egypt, and bring all the records, the record of the purchase, the sealed record, and the open record, and also all the first records in which all the transactions of the birthright are written, fetch you. And you shall bring them unto us here, that we may know from them all the words of Esau and the sons which they spoke this day. And Naphtali hearkened to the voice of Yosef, and he hastened and ran to go down to Egypt. And Naphtali was lighter on foot than any of the stags that were upon the wilderness, for he would go upon the ears of corn without crushing them. So just want to share you a couple of these stories that sh that confirm, since, back to Testament of Naphtali chapter 2, since I was swift on my feet like a deer, my father Jacob appointed me for all missions and messages, and as a deer he blessed me. So, just wanted to share some supporting uh, verses to go along with that. So verse 2. For just as the, a potter knows the pot, how much it holds, and brings clay for it accordingly, so also Yahweh forms the body in correspondence to the spirit and instills the spirit corresponding to the power of the body. Now this is a, this is a very unique verse that we don't get really anything like this anywhere uh, in all of scripture that I'm aware of at this point. That, <clears throat> well, number one, we know that Yahweh knew all of us before we were even in our mother's bellies. And he even called us from before then. But he also knows how our body is going to develop. Um, and he knows the spirit within us. Um, it's just, it's kind of mind-blowing. I want to read this again. This is really powerful. And then we're going to talk a little bit about this. And how that we're all kind of made for a specific purpose. Not just 
what our body shapes are going to be like because you know some of us are tall some of us are short some of us are wide some of us are, th- are thin um whatever some of us are naturally fast some of us aren't um, some of us are naturally talented with certain things some of us have to work really hard at it um but you know that's something that i think just as kind of a, a anecdote this is kind of a side side deal here just knowing that he made us all the way we are and we should be happy with how he made us. And sometimes I think maybe jokingly we'd be like, oh, you know, how nice it would be to have features like so-and-so. But really, we shouldn't care. We should be, like it says here, for just as the potter knows the pot, how much it holds and brings clay accordingly. So does the clay, does the pot say to the potter, why have you made me this way? That's in Isaiah, I think, somewhere. And of course, we shouldn't ever do that. For just as a potter knows the pot, how much it holds, and brings clay for it accordingly, so also Yahweh forms the body in correspondence to the spirit. So we're going to be talking more about spirit and truth later. Physical and not physical. Spiritual. And instills the spirit according to the power of the body. So, let's talk about this for a second. He knows all of our... So the potter knows the vessel. So in this parable of the talents, I just wanted to reinforce this point here that Messiah also recognizes this, that we all have different talents, different uh, different things that we're good at and different things that we're not so good at. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves or servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Listen, each according to his own ability. So he recognized that each of these different people had different abilities and gave according to those abilities. This goes right back to what he's saying here. So also Yahweh forms the body in correspondence to the spirit and instills the spirit corresponding to the power of the body. Uh, Also in Ephesians 4, let's talk about this. So therefore I, the prisoner of the master, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love. And the point here is all I really want to read is that worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And each of us, of course, have been called to the calling of faith and obedience, faith in our Messiah and walking in his commandments. But we each have a specific task. And if you don't have that task, uh, I really would urge you to seek the most high on that. And we'll talk more about that when we read uh, from the uh, book of Elijah the prophet. Being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, shalom. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling. One master, one faith, one baptism, one Elohim and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Messiah's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some, now here's the, excuse me, here's the calling. And it's not just limited to this list. Paul's giving an example and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Messiah until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Oh, what a day that will be. Yah, make this possible. And of the knowledge of the son of Elohim to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Messiah. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceit and scheming, which, boy, I got to tell you, online ministry, this is so rampant. But speaking the truth in love, and and the reason I say that is whenever time you're listening to me or anyone else out there, don't just take it as fact, check it for yourself. And everything that we're going over tonight, back it by the scriptures. And if you can't, then that's something you cannot trust. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Messiah, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So we see that unity here that we're talking about here in the Testament of Pali. 
1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 31. So again, what we're talking about here, just not to lose the the kind of the thought process here, thought process. So also Yahweh forms the body in correspondence to the spirit and instills the spirit in corresponding to the power of the body, knowing that the Most High knew us from the very beginning and has each called us each to our own calling within this calling. And again, within the faith, we each have our duties, our responsibilities, whether they be large or small or something in between. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 31. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same master. There are varieties of effects, but the same Elohim who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, and to another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So, so this isn't like you just wake up one day and be like, well, I want to be a prophet, or I want to be um, a tongue speaker, or I want to be an interpreter of the tongues. He's the one that gives these things. Surely, can we ask? And can he answer that? Sure. But the point is, he is the one who distributes these gifts by that same Spirit as he wills. Just again, as Yahweh forms the body, or just as the potter knows the pot, he knows each one of us and what what our calling is and what what he wants us to do. For just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Messiah. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one part but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, is it not for this reason any less part of the body? And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now Elohim has arranged the parts, each one of them in the body just as he desired, because he is the great potter and we're just his clay. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But now there are many parts, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And <clears throat> unfortunately, this is kind of what's going on in the body is just because people aren't on the exact same mission from the Most High as far as being a worker in the field. They, don't ha they aren't in the exact same lane. People are like, well, what are you doing? You know, you're not doing it exactly like I'm doing. And people are just against each other. And man, wh wh where can when can we just wake up from this nonsense and unite recognizing we're on the same mission and some of us have just different tasks on the contrary it is much true that the parts of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those parts of the body which we consider less honorable on these we bestow greater honor and our less presentable parts become much more presentable whereas our more presentable parts have no need of it but elohim has so compassed the body giving more abundant honor to the part which lacked so that there be no division in the body hello but that the parts may have the same care one for another or for one another. And if one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If a part is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. Now are you Messiah's body and individually parts of it. And Elohim has appointed in the assembly first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. Are are I'm sorry, are not I'm sorry, all are not apostles, are they? No. All are not prophets, are they? No. All are not teachers, are they? No. All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and yet I'm going to show you a far better way. So, obviously the point here is, the point I'm trying to make here is, we've all been called uh, to a calling. And it is our mission in this life to find out what that exactly is. And like I said before, if you do not know what your specific role is in this body, this would be a great time to seek it out. Here's a really encouraging passage as to why we should get there and get there quickly. Listen to this. Chapter 8. This is the book of Elijah the prophet. Uh, I'll have a link for this in the study notes that will be in the link in the description box below. Uh, if you want to read this, 
Yahuwah is the Elohim of knowledge. By his word was everything made which was made, and he governs all things according to his infinite foreknowledge. Listen, even before he created the heavens and the earth, he counseled with the hosts of heaven and planned a plan wherein the spirit of every man should have his appointed role. Listen, wherein the spirit of every man should have his appointed role. For the spirit of every man appeared before Yahuwah Sebaot in the beginning and received a place appointed in the family of heaven and earth. Of course, those that he knew would be his. When a man fills his appointed role, it is according to the glorious design of Yahuwah Sebaot. And thus, as each one functions according to the divine plan, the work of Elohim is pushed toward its consummation. Anyone want to be in New Jerusalem right now? Let me read that again. When a man or woman fills his appointed role, it is according to the glorious design of Yahweh Sebaot. And thus, or in this way, as each one functions according to the divine plan, the work of Elohim is pushed toward its com- consummation. So um, let's get to it. Let's get to it. The designs of Elohim cannot be frustrated. In his hand lies the government of all things, and he sustains all the children of men in their needs. Wherefore, it becomes all men to worship Yahweh the Elohim of Israel and be obedient to the divine plan which he has ordained in their behalf. So, seek him, brothers and sisters. Seek him, and let's get this uh, thing towards consummation towards the end, right? Okay. So, I think we've talked about this enough. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 2, verse 3. And from one to the other, there is no discrepancy, not so much as a third of a hair. For by weight and measure and rule was all the creation made. So, this is, this is I think this verse here answers an age-old question. You know, was was he just like walking around in creation? It was like, mm, poof, 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 everything. So, he sat down and he thought this out he planned it out i'm sure he's so wise that it didn't take very long it doesn't probably take as long for us to like work out a one of those really long math problems remember that remember calculus oh my goodness that's crazy remember how long that took no my point is is everything that he made it was done by weight measure and rule so Everything was organized in order, and that's the Elohim we serve. We serve an Elohim of order and structure, not chaos. And you recognize the perfection in the world. I mean, look around you. Do you look around, and you're like, wow. Think of how everything works together. Sometimes I like to watch documentaries on just the animal world, the plant world, or the trees, and how everything works. And yeah, it bothers me, because almost in every single one, they're like, you know, formed from billions of years, and you're like, come on, stop. But nevertheless, it's still amazing to see, uh, is, there, is that the right word, symbiosis in, in nature and how things work together and how the, the animal kingdom uh, does its thing and the, the plant kingdom. And um, I don't know if we're still supposed to use those kingdom words. All I'm saying is that how everything in nature kind of just works together and how every animal, every insect, everything has its its own food source and I don't know, it's just amazing. I, I just, it's beyond me of the scope and measure of the vastness of this earth and how everything works together. And it just continues to pain me of how the world fails to give him his due honor and respect um, that's owed to him of what he's done for us. So we'll discuss more about this in chapter three, this uh, concept right here. But again, so from one to another, there is no discrepancy, not so much as a third of a hair for by weight and measure and rule was all the creation made. Everything is in order. Just as the potter knows the use of each vessel and to what it is suited for. So this is what we're talking about earlier. So he knows what, how each of us, what our abilities and strengths are again remember he gave to each one according to his several ability and so again just as the potter knows the use of each vessel into what is suited for so also yahuwah knows the body to what extent it will persist in goodness and when it will be dominated by evil and this is how he knows the end from the beginning he knows truly who are his in the book of enoch there's a passage in the dream vision the longer dream vision where it said that all of his sheep had returned to his house uh, kind of lending credibility to knowing at the very beginning, he already know who were going to be his and who were going to be of the kingdom of darkness, who was going to be in the kingdom of light and who was going to be in the kingdom of darkness. There's no fooling him. He knows when we're going to, when we walk in goodness and when we, when people are dominated by evil, 
Second Timothy 2, 19-21, Nevertheless, the foundation of Elohim stands sure. Having this seal, Yahuwah knows them that are his, and he knew that from the beginning. And let everyone that names the name of Messiah depart from iniquity. You look at this word here, it means to depart from lawlessness, depart from not doing the law. So we depart from not doing the law. So that means we do the law. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a vessel of honor or dishonor? The choice is ours. John 10, 27 through 29, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He knows who are his. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Praise Yah. Hebrews 6, so what we're talking about here is people, um, to what extent that will persist in goodness and when it will be dominated by evil. Because we know that by the parable of the seed, the sower, that not all seeds, even though some seeds grow up, they're choked by the world, by persecution or... Um, by um, cares of the world choke it and they become unfruitful and we know what happens to an unfruitful branch in John 15 the unfruitful branch is cut off and thrown into the fire Hebrews 6 4 through 8 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened who had the light in them and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit the Ruach HaKodesh and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the world to come if they shall have fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucified to themselves the son of Elohim afresh and put him to an open shame for the earth which drinks in the rain that comes oft upon it and brings forth herbs meat for them to whom it is dis I'm sorry dressed receives blessing from Elohim but that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and nigh into cursing whose end is to be burned and this is what i was just talking about um, plants that grow up to not bear fruit but bears thorns and briars is rejected and nigh and nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned so anyways point is he knows you can't play church with him you can't um you're not going to fool him he knows exactly who are his and who are not Sirach 30, 14 through 17, better off as a poor man who is well and strong in constitution than a rich man who is severally afflicted in body. Health and soundness are better than all gold and a robust body than countless riches. There is no wealth better than the health of a body and there is no glad gladness above the joy of heart. Death is better than a miserable life and eternal rest than chronic sickness. So this is, we're just kind of taking a literal take here on just as the potter knows the use of each vessel into what is suited for. So also, you know, Yahweh knows the body to what extent it will persist in, in goodness and when it'll be dominated by evil. But we just want to talk. I just wanted to share about just the body in general, because we see that with Naphtali, we have some teachings on physiology that we don't get really out any elsewhere. And we're, we're going to have some more of that here shortly. So, Naphtali 2.5, For there is no inclination or thought which Yahuwah knows not, since he created every human being according to his own image. We talked about this the last two studies, um, more so in the Testament of Zebulun. We talked about it a little bit last week in the Testament of Dan. And we'll just touch on it again here, really, just to remind us that there is no inclination or thought which Yahuwah knows not. So even stuff that's not spoken, but like sitting there dwelling in our mind, he knows it. He knows it. He sees it all. And just to remind us that we have to take every thought captive. So when that when that testing comes, when that thought pops in, it's like, hey, remember when we used to do this? And you're like, and you can go two ways. You can be like, yeah, I do remember. Or you can be like, yeah, I do remember, and I don't ever want to go back to that garbage. And pray. Pray, Yahweh, please take that. Take this dream that I had out of my mind or take this thought that, I, that came up out of nowhere. I don't want it. I don't want this seed to be planted in my heart, Father. Please take it away from me. Whatever. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of Elohim. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. Hallelujah. So again, I don't think any of us are immune to these provoking thoughts or tempting thoughts 
But I think, and I think, I know, it's our responsibility to take these thoughts captive and just to destroy the, of course, the, the wicked ones. Because we, hopefully, uh, I don't know, we're all different parts of our walk. Hopefully, as you continue in your walk, you start to be able to discern between that still small voice that's from above or that other voice that's like, so, uh, whatever. All right. Naphtali 2.6. As a person's strength, so also is his work. As is his mind, so also is his skill. As is his plan, so also is his achievement. As is his heart, so is his speech. And again, we're getting a lesson here on physiology of how things relate to each other. And Messiah really expounds on this, that out of the abundance of the heart, so the mouth speaks. It's like you can't withhold it. Like what's inside of you is going to come out. As is his eye, so also is his sleep. As is his soul, so also is his thought. Whether it be on the Torah of Yahuwah or the law or of Belial, Satan. And this is this is the black and white. We'll talk about that in a second, but let's go back to let's go to the words of Messiah. Matthew six, twenty two through twenty three. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, and we talked a lot about singleness with which testament which testament was singleness. Um because this is an extremely important topic. Um, the Testament of Issachar. We talked a lot about being with the difference of either being single-minded or double-minded. And it's, it's being redundant saying it's extremely important. It is. So if therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, your whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Luke six forty three through forty nine. For a good tree brings forth not corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of his heart the mouth speaks. So this is kind of expounding. So as is his heart, so is his speech. This is kind of the same thing that our Messiah is saying. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And why do you call me master, master, and do not the things which I say? Think about that in case you're new out there and you're like, well, what does that mean? Why do you call him master? I'm just asking if there's anyone out there. Do you call him master and not keep the commandments as he's instructed us to do? We're going to talk about more about that in a second. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently on the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not, does not his words, is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great so but here and all this kind of culminates right here and this is kind of the point so also in his thought whether on the torah of yahuwah or the law the to the the law of, of belier satan so as his soul so is his thought and this is the division <clears throat> this is the <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> this is the great contest of life. Who we're, who we're going to choose? Which kingdom we're going to choose? The kingdom of light or darkness? The kingdom of darkness has many different roads and many passages to get there. All the false religions of the world, even atheism or, um, or whatever. There's, there's many different roads to it. There's only one road to the kingdom of light. And there is no separation. There's no gray area. It's light or darkness, blessing or curses, life or death, sweet or bitter. That's the division he's made. Let's share. Let's share some passages about this. First of all, we have to get to some defining verses here. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law. This is the Hebrew word here, be Torah. The Torah is light, period. The Torah is light. Psalm 19, 7 through 10. The Torah of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. As is his soul, so also is thought, whether on the Torah of Yahweh 
or the law of Satan, converting the soul. The Torah converts the soul. The testimony of Yahuwah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahuwah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahuwah is pure, enlightening the eyes, giving light to the eyes. The fear of Yahuwah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahuwah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. So, I said all that to say this. So we see that the Torah is, sorry, the Torah is light and that the Torah is sweeter than honey. Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto to them that call evil good, I'm sorry, that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What is this talking about? Woe. Destruction is coming upon you that call the Torah evil, period. Or that it's done away with or it's antiquated or it's not for us. And just to show you a little more separation, I want to show you something that's not can't be a coincidence. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8. And all these words which I command you this day, so his Torah, his commandments, shall be in your heart. As is his heart, so is his speech. As his eyes, so is his sleep. As his soul, also his thought, whether on the Torah of Yahuwah or the law of Satan. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall bind them, the Torah, the commandments, as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Spiritually, these commandments should be on our hand and on our forehead. And is it just a coincidence that this is the mark of Yah, and then you have the mark of the beast. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand on their foreheads. Is it coincidence, do you think, that there's a mark of Yah, which is in the hand of the forehead, or there's a mark of the beast in the hand of the forehead? Hand of the forehead. So this is the separation. And Satan, again, has many traps to get people into his kingdom of darkness. But there's only one path that leads to the Most High. And that's faith in Messiah and the path that he that he confirmed was the Torah in many ways. If you're new and you're like, what are you talking about? I'll share with you. Stick around, please. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. What did he set before them? He set before them the Torah. Life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Choosing life is to choose to walk in his ways. Choosing, choosing death is to choose to walk away from his ways. So choice is ours. Back to Testament of Naphtali, chapter 2, verse 7. As there is a distinction between light and darkness, we just talked about that, between seeing and hearing, thus there is a distinction between man and man, and between woman and woman, and it is not to be said that there, there is one like the other, either in face or mind. We can have some people that look like us, but there's not an exact replica of any of us. For Elohim made all things good in their order. We were just talking about that. The five senses in the head. To the head he attached the neck, in addition to the hair for the enhancement of appearance. Then the heart for understanding. Now we're going to see this more physiology relating to spiritual world. Manifesting. The heart for understanding. Where's your heart? He tests our heart. The belly for excretion from the stomach. That's obvious. The windpipe for health. The liver for anger. Now, this is something that's really, really interesting. We, I think we talked about this in the Testament of Reuben. Uh, and of the, or no, it was the Testament of Simeon, I believe. We talked about this in the association. The liver for anger. The gallbladder for bitterness. Now, it is really interesting to find out and for, through certain testimonies that learning from some people that have liver or gallbladder issues struggled with anger, resentment, bitterness. There's something to that. The liver for anger, the gallbladder for bitterness, the spleen for laughter, the kidneys for craftiness, the loins for power, the lungs for drawing in air, the hips for strength, and so on. So then, my children, let all your works be done in order with good intent in the fear of Elohim and do nothing disorderly in scorn or not in an appropriate time. So what he's saying is, first of all, Number one, the Most High made everything in order. Structure um, structure surrounds everything he does. 
And we're supposed to be made in the image of Elohim. So he says, so like Yah has done everything in its order and structure, so then, my children, let all your works be done in order with good intent in the fear of Elohim and do nothing disorderly in scorn or in not in an appropriate time. So orderly. Just a couple of verses to share with this. First <clears throat> Corinthians 14, 40, but in all things must be done properly in an orderly way. And then verse 33, for Elohim is not an Elohim of confusion. There's other translations that say disorder. For Elohim is not an, an Elohim of disorder, but of shalom, but of peace, as in all the assemblies of the saints. So everything we're supposed to do is in order. And we'll talk about that in a second. So how do we know? How do we know what's truly in order? Sure, we, we know... Um, daily life and what that looks like going to sleep waking up eating food preparing things but what in the overall scope of really of really what's important in life how do we know what's orderly what's good and what's not how we discern through those things uh we'll talk about that more that in a second but here's a great passage because he says do nothing disorderly in scorn or and not in an appropriate time there's an appropriate time for everything and solomon writes about this uh, very wisely ecclesiastes 3 1 through 8 to everything there is a season so which would all be appropriate time so everything for everything there's an appropriate time and a time to every purpose under the, the heaven a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted a time to kill and a time to heal a time to break down and a time to build up a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And this is something really I think our generation could learn a lot of recognizing that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So just recognizing, we have to recognizing that, recognize, I'm sorry. We have to recognizing that there's a time for everything. And I don't know if I, I thought I had the verse pulled up here, but there's a passage, it's in the, I think it's in the Psalm that says, be not like the horse or the mule that needs a bit in the mouth to be turned in every direction. So <clears throat> what that's essentially saying is that we should have some discernment of a time and season for everything. And this is kind of what Naftali is saying here, not doing anything in a, in, a, in a, I'm sorry, or not in an appropriate time. So doing everything orderly and doing it at an appropriate time. So we have to discern these things. And sometimes we have forks in the road and troubling things, of course, seeking the most high. And when we do, we do. All right. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 2, verse 10. If you tell the eye to hear, it cannot. So you are unable to perform the works of light while you are in darkness. We talked about, again, the light and the darkness. Proverbs 6.23 says the Torah is light. 1 John 2, 1 through 11. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says this. <clears throat> Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law or the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. That's your definition of what sin is. So I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahushua Hamashiach the righteous. And he is the propitiation or atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby, or this is how we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in him verily is the love of Elohim perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he lives in him or abides in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So he that's so, the person that says, well, I'm in Messiah. I'm a believer in Messiah. We're supposed to walk like he walked. And how did he walk? He walked in faith and obedience. Faith in his heavenly father and the obedience to his Torah, to his law. And just to confirm that, he says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. So this is not some new commandment that was formed, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. What's the beginning? It was since Genesis, since the beginning, the Torah. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, or also, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because darkness is past, and the true light now shines. He that says that he is in the light and hates his brother 
is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he goes because that darkness has blinded his eyes. John three fifteen through 21. So knowing, again, the definition of light, the Torah is light. Let's read the most popular verse in the world, John three fifteen, or three sixteen. but let's go to 15. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Elohim sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Elohim. And this is the condemnation, that light, Torah, is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, the Torah, because their deeds were evil. Doesn't that make sense? For everyone that does evil hates the light, Torah, neither comes to the light, the Torah, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does the truth comes to the light, the Torah, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are rotten Elohim. And here is one of the most veiled parables, I think of all, that follows the most popular verse in the world of Messiah teaching the keeping of the Torah. <clears throat> so again, if you tell the eye to hear, it cannot. So you are unable to perform the works of light, the works of the Torah, while you are in darkness, especially if you hate your brother, as we just learned in First John 2. Chapter 3. Do not strive to corrupt your actions through covetousness or to beguile your souls by empty phrases because if you keep silence and purity of heart, you shall understand how to hold fast the will of Elohim and to cast away the will of Belial, Satan. Sun, moon, and stars do not alter their order. So thus, or in this way, you should not alter the Torah of Elohim by the disorder of your actions. This is a really cool passage. I want to read um, Enoch chapter 2 through 5. This is really short. So just like Naphtali is like, recognize the sun, moon, and stars. They don't alter anything. Everything stays the same. Enoch says the same thing. Observe you everything that takes place in the heaven, how they do not change their orbits, and the luminaries which are in heaven, how they all rise and set in order each in its season and transgress not against their appointed order. Behold, look you, look at look at the earth, and give heed to the things which take place upon it from first to last. How steadfast they are. They're firm. They're immovable. How none of the things upon the earth change, but all the works of Elohim appear to you. Behold the summer and the winter, how the whole earth is filled with water, and clouds and dew and rain lie upon it. Observe and see how in the winter all the trees seem as though they had withered and shed their leaves, except fourteen trees which do not lose their foliage, but retain the old foliage from two to three years till the new comes. Again, observe you the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth over against it, and how you seek shade and shelter by reason of the heat of the sun. And the earth also burns with growing heat, and so you cannot tread on the earth or on a rock by reason of its heat. Last chapter. Observe you how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit, Wherefore, so because of this, give heed and know and with regard to all his works and recognize how he that lives forever has made them so. A big part of our walk and is just simply acknowledging, like, look at what you've made, Father. It's amazing. Thank you so much. And all his works go on thus or this way from year to year forever and all the tasks which they accomplish for him. And their tasks change not, but according as Elohim has ordained, so it is done. And behold, how the sea and the rivers in like manner accomplish and change not their tasks from his commandments. But you have not been steadfast, nor done the commandments of Yahuwah. But you have turned away and spro spoken proud and hard words with your impure mouths against his greatness. And how many of us were that way? How many of us had not done the commandments of Yah and being steadfast in what we were made to do although he's given us freedom of choice he didn't make us do it but he ordered us this is what you need to do if you want to live here's the choice so we just read in enoch two through five the same thing sun moon and stars do not alter their order in this way you should not alter the torah of elohim by the disorder of your actions 
<clears throat> Sirach 16, 24. Listen to me, my son, and acquire knowledge, and pay close attention to my words. I will impart instruction by weight and declare knowledge accurately. The works of Yahuwah have existed from the beginning by his creation, and when he made them, he determined their divisions. He arranged his works in an eternal order and their dominion for all generations. They neither hunger nor grow weary, and they do not cease from their labors. They do not crowd one another aside, and they will never disobey his word. After this, Yahuwah looked upon the earth and filled it with his good things, and with all kinds of living beings he covered its surface, and to, and to it they returned. Just giving him more glory of how awesome he is. Naphtali 3.3 3, The Gentiles, or the nations, because they wandered astray and forsook Yahuwah, have changed the order and have devoted themselves to stones and sticks, patterning themselves after the wandering spirits or the unclean spirits. And we learn in Enoch that these unclean spirits, these devils, if you will, these these demons that oppress and afflict and battle and oppress and or and, and um um lead people astray, these wandering spirits came from the departed spirits of these giants. The angels came down, according to Genesis 6, the sons of Elohim came down, took women, and they bare giants. Some of these giants died. The The departed spirits of these giants became these wandering spirits. And these wandering spirits have, have, have led men and women astray. The nations at one point all had the commands in the book of jubilees chapter 7 and 10 we learn that all the sons of noah were given all the commandments and they kept them for a while but then they went astray we also learned that noah knew that these departed spirits from the giants these wandering spirits were the ones that were leading them astray <clears throat> to esdras 7 17 through 25 the book we read earlier sarak and this book to esdras were both included in the apocrypha section um, of the uh, 1611 KJV and many others. But 2 Ezra 7, 17 says this, Then I answered and said, O sovereign master, behold, you have ordained in your law that the righteous shall inherit these things, but that the ungodly shall perish. The righteous, therefore, can endure difficult circumstances while hoping for easier ones. But those who have done wickedly have suffered the difficult circumstances and will not see the easier ones. And he said to me, You are not a better judge than Elohim or wiser than the Most High. Let many perish now who are perish who are now living rather than the law of Elohim, the Torah of Elohim, which is set before them be disregarded. For Elohim strictly commanded those who came into the world when they came what they should do to live and what they should observe to avoid punishment. Nevertheless, they were not obedient and spoke against him. They devised for themselves vain thoughts and proposed to themselves wicked frauds. They even declared that the Most High does not exist and they ignored his ways. Does that sound familiar with what's going on today in our world? They scorned his law, even in the believing community, people that believe in Messiah. They scorned his law, denied his covenants, and have been unfaithful to his statutes and have not performed his works. Therefore, Ezra, empty things are for the empty and full things are for the full. Think about the vessel. Think about the vessel the potter fashioned. Some vessels are full and some are empty. Let's keep going. Naphtali 3, verse 4. But you, my children, shall not be like that, shall not be like the nations who have forsook Yahweh's Torah. In the firmament, in the earth, and in the sea, in all the products of his workmanship, discern Yahweh, who made all things, so that you do not become like Sodom, which departed from the order of nature. Likewise, the watchers departed from nature's order. Yahweh pronounced a curse on, on them at the flood. On their account, he made the earth without inhabitant and fruitless. Whew. Sodom, right? Jude. I will therefore put to you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the master, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. So just because you're saved and believe doesn't mean you're going to make it out of the wilderness into the promised land. That's the same story. The pattern is there for us to learn. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul warns us the same thing. Hey, this whole wall, the whole wall, wilderness, the whole wilderness experience, the whole wilderness experience is for our correction and admonition. Don't learn from them, or I'm sorry, learn from their mistakes and don't do the same thing. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These are the watchers that uh, Naphtali mentions. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And what is this? We learn that the men 
the men would lay with men, the women would lay with women, and all kinds of uh, just sexual deviancy. And look at our world today. What was become, what was once uh, taboo, um, has become commonplace, has become not only accepted, but promoted and celebrated. Like, wow, look how brave this person is for doing these things that defy the Most High. Look how brave this person is for check, changing their sexual orientation. Look how brave and wonderful they are. That's what the world says, which is completely ridiculous. But the problem is, and what's really troubling is, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves order of fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. This is what's going to come upon a lot of people. May Yah help us to be lights to pull people out of this because I don't think a single person has gone too far. Even people that engage in these um, disorder of nature, which Paul talks about in Romans 1, the, the men leaving women to, to be with men. So the same thing right here says Naphtali. So that you do not become like Sodom, which departed from the order of nature. But even people in this world who have departed from the order of this, this nature have the opportunity to repent and to turn to Messiah and turn to the commandments of the Torah of the Most High. And that's our job. Those of us that understand this, it's our job to, to share with the world, not to judge them from you know, looking from the outside. Be like, oh, lost. See ya. Have fun burning like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how some people act, but that's not how we should act. We should have pity and compassion and know that these people have just been deceived Unfortunately, the devil is very good at what he does, and if he's deceived them, that's why I was saying earlier: there's it's light or darkness. There's not multiple paths to 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 life, to life eternal. There's one path. It's Messiah. And Messiah told us how to walk. He told us how to walk in faith and obedience. Man has destroyed this knowledge through man-made traditions and man-made given commandments. Nothing new under the sun. The point is, is that. These people who are in these sinful behaviors that have changed the order of nature have done so because they were deceived into thinking that Yah doesn't exist and that his commandments aren't to be kept. Now even creeping into the Christian churches are these doctrines of accepting these things into their churches. We live in some interesting times, brothers and sisters. I also find it really interesting that in the Testament of Tali it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and then the watchers very much after the same pattern we see here in Jude, we see the watchers in Sodom and Gomorrah all here in the same passage. Ezekiel, speaking more about Sodom, Ezekiel 16, As I live, says Yahweh Elohim, Sodom, your sister, has not done she nor her daughters as you have done, you and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride. Think about our, think about our world right now. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty, prideful, and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Luke 17. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, so in this same way, shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So, I find it really interesting because I think a lot of us know that um, trouble and woes are coming upon this world and this country in a, very, in a very quick way. But if we take the master's words literally here, he says things are going to kind of be just going on like they are. Is that what it's going to be like when the financial total financial meltdown happens or the reset or, or the great reset or... Whatever that happens, will life really be going on like normal? Will people just be eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage? And will that is that how it's going to be? He's saying it's not going to be like that. I mean, he's saying that it's going to be life's just going to keep going on like normal. So I believe that he's going to come back before all hell breaks loose on earth, if you will. It's one of the many reasons why I believe that, but for another time. All right, so chapter four of Naphtali. I say these things, my children, because I have read in the writing of the Holy Enoch that you will stray away from Yahweh, living in accord with every wickedness of the nations and committing every lawlessness of Sodom. 
Yahweh will impose captivity upon you. You shall serve your enemies, and there you will be engulfed in hardship and difficulty until Yahweh will wear you all out. And through this, we learn in the book of Enoch, we did a um, Enoch line by line a series. We went through the entire book of Enoch, and we see this in the dream visions of Enoch. We see how there's going to be different ages. And after the age of Abraham would be the age of the kings. And then they would kind of go astray. And then Messiah would come and ascend. Um, and then after his ascension, there would be a time of just total apostasy. And so they saw these things that they're just going to totally fall away. But the good news is, after that time of apostasy, the Most High is going to start waking up his people again to his truth and bringing him back. And when that happens, that's going to bring us into the next age, which is the Millennial Kingdom age, which is... I pray near night hand. What do I know? Naphtali 4.3 And after you have been decimated and reduced in number, you will return and acknowledge Yahuwah your Elohim. And it shall happen that when they come into the land of their fathers, they will again neglect Yahuwah and act impiously. And we, of course, we know that this is talking about the dispersion of, seven, uh, of um, um, Jerusalem through uh, Nebuchadnezzar going into captivity in Babylon seven years then coming back but they will again neglect Yahuwah and act impiously. And Yahuwah will disperse them over the face of the whole earth, 70 AD, until the compassion of Yahuwah comes, a man who affects righteousness, and he will work mercy on all who are far and near. And in uh, chapter 5, actually, I want to I mention this, and he will work mercy on all who are far and near. Paul actually touches on this, those uh, actual words in Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, so you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Messiah, excluded from the people of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without Elohim in the world. But now, in Messiah, Yahushua, you who previously were far away, and this is the terminology here, and he will work mercy on all who are far and near. So you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. Brought near to what? Of course, the people of Israel. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one. That's the, that's the bloodline of Israel and the nations who were not. They were two different people. But both groups into one, and he broke down the barrier of dividing wall between those two groups by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances. And you look at this. This is dogma, which is man-made laws, so that himself he might make the two one new person, in this way establishing peace. And we know that it was a law for the Jews not to um, break bread or sit down with Gentiles, with nations. And you won't find that in the Torah. You'll find that in man-made doctrines, like in the Talmud and the oral law and traditions that the Pharisees were so accustomed to. So he destroyed them. He didn't destroy the Torah of the Most High. He destroyed the man-made commandments expressed in ordinances. And again, if you look up this word ordinances, it's the word dogma, which alludes to man-made traditions. So that he might make himself the two, one new person in this way, establishing peace or shalom, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to Elohim through the cross by it having put to death the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and those two who were near. This is what we see in Aftali. And he will work mercy on all who are far and near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And of course, those who were near were those those Jews living in Judea and Benjamites and the Levites that were there. Those who were far away were either the scattered lost ten tribes or even those who were of the nations. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow, fellow citizens with the saints and are of Elohim's household. And of course, that's Israel. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Messiah, Yahushua himself being the cornerstone, in whom the build, whole building being fitted together is growing into a body, or a home, sorry, into a holy temple in Yahuwah and whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of Elohim in the Spirit. Praise you. All right. So chapter 5 of Naphtali. In the 40th year of my life, I saw on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, that the sun and the moon stood still. And behold, Isaac, my father's father, was saying to us, Run forth, seize them, each according to his capacity. 
To the one who grasped them will the sun and the moon belong. All of them ran, but Levi seized the sun, and Judah, outstripping the others, grasped the moon. Thus they were exalted above the others. So just like the sun and the moon are exalted above the rest of the, the luminaries, Levi and Judah were exalted above the rest of his brethren, which we know because Levi got the priesthood, Judah got the uh, kingship. Levi became like the sun. Why? Because it was Levi's job to minister the Torah, the Torah being the light. A certain young man gave him 12 palm branches. And Judah became luminous like the moon, and twelve rays were under his feet. Then running toward the others, Levi and Judah seized them. And behold, there was a bull on the earth with two great horns and an eagle's wings on his back, and they tried to lay hold of him, but were unable. But Joseph overtook them and seized him and went up with him into the heights. And I looked since I was there, and behold, a sacred writing appeared to us, which said, Assyrians, Medes, Persians, Elamites, Galatians, Chaldeans, Syrians shall obtain a share in the 12 staffs of Israel through captivity, shall possess in captivity the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's kind of interesting that, um, I think this is what, this is seven, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we know in Revelation, you have the great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns. I think uh, the 10 horns has been properly, um, uh, deciphered throughout the ages uh, and we talked about this in our um, um, the Beast of Revelation video that's on our homepage if you want to check that out but it's, it's I actually want I didn't re really go into it really close in this study but this is something that I would like to really take a look a closer look at and seeing this is like the ten crowns separate from the ten horns these are like the seven kingdoms that shall possess in captivity the twelve tribes of Israel the ones that persecuted them uh past and previous no or previous and future so just kind of interesting and again after this i'm sorry actually let me pause here real quickly there's something else i wanted to mention before we get into chapter six in verse five it said and judah became luminous like the moon you can like read right past them like, okay so what well luminous means to give light and it says Judah became luminous like the moon. So the moon gives light, right? Mark 13, 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. There's many more mentions of the moon giving her own light. And I say that because every time I come across scriptures that challenge modern day science, I like to bring it up because even Paul says science falsely so-called. There's science and then there's scientism because we look at reading the book of Daniel. It said Daniel was wise in all science and other things. So there is an actual study of science, but I think in today's world, it's more so something called scientism, which has become a new religion. It's a religion that just wants to oppose the Torah and the truth of the Most High. And I say that because in modern day science, astronomy, they say the moon does not give light, but it's just a big floating rock that reflects light from the sun. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever like shined like a bright light? I mean, dirt and rock doesn't reflect light like that. I mean, like the, the light from the moon casts shadows. Have you ever been outside? and actually looked at that, like when the moon is like full or getting close to full, and you look at how it casts shadows from trees and things like that, and you're like, wait a minute. How How is that? So the sun is going, is shining on the moon, and then it's bouncing back and reflecting, and it's also so powerful that it's casting a shadow. Or the Bible is true, and it says the moon gives its own light. It says the moon shall not give her own light, alluding to or very obviously saying that the moon has its own light. The book of Enoch says the light of the moon is, or the light of the sun is seven times brighter than the light of the, of the sun. And so here's just uh, another great opportunity to take the word literally, which I like to do. If you're more curious about what the Bible says versus what science says, according to cosmology and biblical cosmology, uh, we have a playlist in our playlist section called Biblical Cosmology Basics. I would highly recommend taking a look at that. I think it is fascinating. As we said, we're living in a time where Yahweh is exposing the lies and sharing truth with us. Praise Yah.
All right. And also, it's interesting to note here that there's a bull on the earth with two great horns and an eagle's wing on his back. Kind of reminds us of some of the animals that we see in Daniel's vision in chapter 7. But I think I might want to do another study just on this because I find it really fascinating here. You've got these seven kingdoms here, possibly alluding to the seven, um, seven crowns on the beast. And is it possible that these nations, who are called by different names at this time, could be part of those seven crowns in the future. Maybe. Something to think about. All right, chapter six of Naphtali. And again, after the seven months, I saw our father, Jacob, standing by the sea at Jamnia, and we and his sons were with him. This is uh, modern day, Jamnia is modern day Yavne, which I'll show you a picture of. So, they were standing here. In this area probably where modern day Tel Aviv is which I don't know if you've seen what's going on in Tel Aviv these days talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and wickedness Whew. and again after seven months I saw our father Jacob standing by the sea at Jamnia and we and his sons were with him and behold a ship came sailing past full of dried fish without sailor or pilot inscribed on it was the ship of Jacob so our father said to us get in the boat as we boarded, a violent tempest arose and a great windstorm, and our father, who had been holding us on course, was snatched away from us. After being tossed by the storm, the boat was filled with water and carried along the waves until it broke apart. Joseph escaped in a light boat, and while we were scattered about on the ten planks, Levi and Judah were on the same. Thus we were dispersed even to the ends of the earth. And this is exactly how it went. You've got uh, Levi and Judah that were in the same territory they uh and the other 10 were scattered but then you have joseph escaped in a light boat and that kind of alludes to really america being ephraim which ephraim is the name given to um well joseph the the tribe of joseph uh ephraim became like the the dominant one that would be the fullness of the nations and so it's kind of interesting that through this dream here you see the scattering Perhaps Ephraim going to uh, America, the, the the ten tribes being scattered, and of course Levi and Judah being what became Jews, Judean in the uh, the southern kingdom. But anyways, thus we were dispersed even to the ends of the earth. Levi, putting on sackcloth, prayed to Yahuwah in behalf of all of us. When the storm ceased, the ship reached the land as it were in peace. Then Yaakov, our father, approached, and we all rejoiced in one accord. These two dreams I recounted to my father and replied, these things must be fulfilled at their appropriate time once Israel has endured many things. So Naphtali was given the prophecy of the scattering of Israel uh, long ago. And of course, then the, re the final regathering to which they will live in total shalom, rejoicing in one accord. And so I find it really interesting that um, we also find a little, a little part of this in the book of Tobit, Tobias. Oh no. Here we go. Book of Tobit. Um, we see, well, let's just read about Tobit. Tobit is a, um, from the tribe of Naphtali, but we'll see, who was taken in captivity in Assyria and who kept the Torah even in dispersion, kind of like we are right now, and that he was given a sneak peek vision of this rejoicing in one accord in New Jerusalem. Let's read about it. The book of the Acts of Tobit, the son of Tobiel, the son of Aniel, the son of Aduel, the son of Gabael, of the descendants of Asiel in the tribe of Naphtali, who in the days of Shalmaneser, king of the Assyrians, was taken into captivity from Thisbe, which is to the south of Kadesh Naphtali in Galilee above Asher. I, Tobit, walked in the ways of truth and righteousness all the days of my life, and I performed many acts of charity to my brethren and countrymen who went with me into the land of the Assyrians to Nineveh. Now, when I was in my own country, in the land of Israel, while I was still a young man, the whole tribe of Naphtali, my forefather, deserted the house of Jerusalem. This was the place with which I had been chosen from among all the tribes of Israel, where all the tribes should sacrifice and where the temple of the dwelling of the Most High was consecrated and established for all generations forever. All the tribes that joined in apostasy used to sacrifice to the calf Baal, and so did the house of Naphtali, my forefather. But I alone went often to Jerusalem for the feasts, as it is ordained for all Israel by an everlasting decree. 
Taking the first fruits and the tithes of my produce and the first shearings, I would give these to the priests, the sons of Aaron at the altar. Of all my produce, I would give a tenth to the sons of Levi who ministered at Jerusalem. A second tenth I would sell, and I would go and spend the proceeds each year at Jerusalem. The third tenth I would give to those to whom it was my duty, as Deborah, my father's mother, had commanded me. For I was left an orphan by my father. When I became a man, I married Anna, a member of our family, and by her I became the father of Tobias. Now when I was carried away captive to Nineveh, all my brethren and my relatives ate the food of the Gentiles, but I kept myself from eating it, because I remembered Elohim with all my heart. Then the Most High gave me favor and good appearance in the sight of Shalmaneser, and I was his buyer of provisions. So I used to go into Media, and once at Ragiz in Media I left ten talents of silver in trust with Gabael, the brother of Gabrias. But when Shalmaneser died, Sennacherib, his son, reigned in his place, and under him the highways were unsafe, so that I could no longer go into Media. In the days of Shalmaneser, I performed many acts of charity to my brethren. I would give my bread to the hungry, and my clothing to the naked. And if I saw any one of my people dead and thrown out behind the wall of Nineveh, I would bury him. And if Sennacherib the king put to death any of who came fleeing from Judea, I buried them secretly. For in his anger he put many to death. And when the bodies were sought by the king, they were not found. Then one of the men of Nineveh went and informed the king about me, that I was burying them, so I hid myself. And when I learned that I was being searched for to be put to death, I left home in fear. Then all my property was confiscated, and nothing was left to me except my wife Anna and my son Tobias. But not fifty days passed before two of Sennacherib's sons killed him, and they fled to the mountains of Ararat. Then Esharhad, Esharhadon, his son, reigned in his place. And he appointed Ahikar, the son of my brother Anael, over all the accounts of his kingdom and over the entire administration. Ahikar interceded for me, and I returned to Nineveh. Now Ahikar was a cupbearer, keeper of the signet, and in charge of administration of the accounts, for Esharhadon had appointed him second to himself, and he was my nephew. When I arrived home, and my wife Anna and my son Tobias were restored to me, at the Feast of Pentecost, which is the sacred festival of the seven weeks, a good dinner was prepared for me, and I sat down to eat. So all that I wanted to read all this to just share with you that this is Naphtali. And though he may not be able to perform everything perfectly, he was doing the best he could in the land of captivity. And I believe that's where we are now. We're in captivity. We're not in the land of promise. But I think we should still strive and do the best we can to keep the Most High's ways. And here he is keeping the feast days in the land of Nineveh in dispersion. Upon seeing the abundance of food, I said to my son, Go and bring whatever poor man of our brethren you may find who is mindful of Yahuwah, and I'll wait for you. But he came back and said, Father, one of our people has been strangled and thrown into the marketplace. So before I tasted anything, I sprang up and removed the body to a place of shelter until sunset. And when I returned, I washed myself and ate my food in sorrow. All right. So now let's. I read all that. I really read all that to read this. Here we have, again, Naphtali prophesying of the dispersion, but also prophesying of the regathering, the true regathering, which will be at the, the end and with New Jerusalem. And here we have a picture of New Jerusalem in Tobiah or Tobit, chapter 13. If you're wondering, Tobit was also included in the 1611 KJV under the Apocrypha section. This was once considered scripture for quite some time. Then Tobit wrote a prayer of rejoicing and said, Blessed is Elohim who lives forever, and blessed is his kingdom, for he afflicts and shows mercy. He leads down to hell and brings up, or to Sheol and brings up again. And there is no one who can escape his hand. Acknowledge him before the nations, O sons of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Make his greatness known there and exalt him in the presence of all the living, because he is our master and Elohim. He is our father forever. He will afflict us for our iniquities. And again, he will show mercy and will gather us from all the nations among whom you have been scattered. If you turn to him with all your heart, and with all your soul to do what is true before him, then he will turn to you and will not hide his face from you. But see what he will do with you. Give thanks to him with your full voice. Praise Yahweh of righteousness and exalt the king of the ages. I give him thanks in the land of my captivity, and I show his power and majesty to a nation of sinners. Turn back, you sinners, and do right before him. Who knows who, who knows who knows if he will accept you and have mercy on you? I exalt my Elohim. My soul exalts the king of heaven, and I will rejoice in his majesty. Let all men speak and give him thanks in Jerusalem. This is New Jerusalem, by the way. O Jerusalem, the holy city, he will afflict you for the deeds of your sons. But again, he will show mercy to the sons of the righteous. Give thanks worthily to Yahuwah and praise the king of the ages, that his tent may be raised for you again with joy. 
May he cheer those within you who are captives and love those within you who are distressed to all generations forever. Many nations will come from afar to the name of Yahweh Elohim, bearing gifts in their hands, gifts for the King of heaven. Generations of generations will give you joyful praise. Cursed are all they who hate you. Blessed forever will be they who love you. Rejoice and be glad for the sons of the righteous, for they will be gathered together and will praise Yahweh of righteous of the righteous. How blessed are those who love you. They will rejoice in your peace. Blessed are those who are grieve over all your afflictions, for they will rejoice for you upon seeing all your glory, and they will be made glad forever. Let my soul praise the Elohim, the great king, for Jerusalem or New Jerusalem will be built with sapphires and emeralds, her walls with precious stones and her towers and battlements with pure gold. The streets of Jerusalem will be paved with beryl and ruby and stones of Ophir. All her lanes will cry, Hallelujah, and will give praise, saying, Blessed is Elohim who has exalted you forever. And I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I want to be there with you. All right, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. So these two dreams I recounted to my father, and he replied, These things must be fulfilled at their appointed appropriate time. Once Israel has endured many things. Then my father said, I believe that Yosef is alive for I continually see that Yahweh includes him in the number with you. And he kept saying tearfully, you live Yosef, my son, and I do not see you, nor do you behold Jacob who begot you. He made me shed tears by these words of his. I was burning inwardly with compassion to tell him that Yosef had been sold, but I was afraid of my brothers. Chapter eight. Behold, my children, I've shown you the last times, all things that will happen in Israel. Command your children that they be in unity with Levi and Judah, for through Judah will the salvation arise for Israel, and in him will Jacob be blessed. Through his kingly power, Elohim will appear, dwelling among men on the earth, to save the race of Israel and to assemble the righteous from among the nations. Hallelujah. Matthew thirteen forty seven through 49 and Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Remember, Matthew twenty two fourteen For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew seven twenty one through 23 Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, or Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So do, do denotes action. Many will say to me that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name, which we know unbelievers don't do that, and in your name have done, have cast out devils, unbelievers don't do that, and in your name have done many wonderful works, unbelievers don't do that either. Believers do that. And then I will profess unto them, these believers, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And how do we know him? First John 2, 3. Not 2, 2, 2, 3. He says, I never knew you. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Very simple. Man makes it confusing. The word makes it very easy. First John 3, 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. So again, through his kingly power, Elohim will appear dwelling among men on the earth to save the race of Israel and to assemble the righteous from among the nations. Deuteronomy 6, 25, It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do these commandments before Yahweh Elohim as he commanded us. Let no one deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Praise Yah. Testament of Naphtali 8.4. We're almost done. If you work that which is good, my children, men and angels will bless you, and Elohim will be glorified through you among the Gentiles or the nations. And that was the commandment of Messiah. Let's not forget. Messiah said, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives un light unto all that are in the house. Remember, we define the term of light. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
So if you work that which is good, my children, men and angels will bless you and Elohim will be glorified through you among the nations. How do we know what's good? Working what is good? We know that according to the Torah. The devil will flee from you. Wild animals will be afraid of you. And the angels will stand by you. Praise Yah. As a man who has trained a child well is kept in kindly remembrance, so also for a good work there is a good remembrance before Elohim. This is just a quick little reminder that we are to train our children. Sirach 2, or Sirach 30, verse 2. He who disciplines his son will profit by him and will boast of him among his acquaintances. He who teaches his son will make his enemies envious and will glory in him in the presence of his friends. The father may die, and yet he is not dead, for he has left behind him one like himself. While alive, he saw and rejoiced, and when he died, he was not grieved. He has left behind him an avenger against his enemies and one to repay the kindness of his friends. He who spoils his son will bind up his wounds, and his feelings will be troubled at every cry. A horse that is untamed turns out to be stubborn, and a son unrestrained turns out to be willful. This is a powerful verse, parents. Pamper a child, and he will frighten you. Play with him, and he will grieve you give you grief do not laugh with him lest you have sorrow with him and in the end you will gnash your teeth and i don't think this is saying you can't like play with your kids or ever laugh with them but this is i think talking about in general being their friend instead of being their father or, or mother give him no authority in his youth and do not ignore his errors bow down his neck in his youth and beat his sides while he is young lest he become stubborn and disobey you and you have sorrow of his soul from him discipline your son and take pains with him that you may not be offended by his shamelessness Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances with which Yahweh Elohim commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear Yahweh Elohim and you and your son and your son's sons by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as Yahuwah, the Elohim of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah Elohim is one, and you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. And earlier we read in the the um, book of Elijah, the prophet, that when we do what we're called to do, we push forward the consummation of times. Also, as more people come back to the Torah, them and their children, it's also going to push this timeline of when it's time. So let's get to work. Deuteronomy 30. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where Yahweh Elohim has driven you, and return to Yahweh Elohim, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you this day, with all your heart and with all your soul, that then Yahweh Elohim will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh Elohim has gathered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there Yahweh your Elohim will gather you, and from there he will fetch you. Praise Yah. So, let's get to work. Let's be the light. Let's share the light. And not keep it hidden under a basket anymore. Um, there was some discrepancy in the text, but I couldn't find verses six through seven in any, in any, uh, versions out there. So may not, we not, may not have had the entire passage. So anyways, uh, Naphtali eight, eight, the one who does not do what is good, men and angels will curse him and Elohim will be dishonored among the nations because of him. The devil will inhabit him as his own instrument. Every wild animal will dominate him and Yahuwah will hate him. Listen to this. For the commandments of the Torah are twofold. And through prudence must they be fulfilled. Now, what does that mean? For the commandments of the Torah are twofold. Anybody know out there? The twofold aspect of the Torah. Our Messiah talked about this with a woman at the will. John 4, 20 through 24. Our fathers worshipped, and this is the this is the woman at the well speaking. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain which is in Samaria, Mount Gerizim. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yehusha said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you know not what. 
we know what we worship for salvation is of the Yahudim, the Jews. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. Elohim is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in a twofold manner. Spirit and truth. Let's talk about truth. Psalm 19, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law, your Torah, is the truth. So we worship him according to the commandments of the Torah. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is the truth. So really, all the word is truth. Truth is the instructions outlined in the Torah, which is like the base foundation. We also learn truth through through the, the wisdom, the writings, Proverbs, Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiastes, many other writings. The prophets, that's his word. Your word is truth. We're we'll talking about spirit. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh, flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Being under the law means under the penalty of breaking the law. Because if you're led of the spirit, you'll be led to walk in his Torah. And how do we know that? Because the whole reason he gave, the whole reason he gave the Spirit was in Ezekiel 36. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my commandments and do them. So the Spirit was given to help us guide us into this Torah. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Although it's commonly taught that the works of the flesh are keeping the Torah, you'll see here that the works of the flesh are in transgression of the Torah, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. So commandment breakers will not be in the kingdom. But the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, which is shalom, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control, against such there is no law. So that's spirit and truth. So the commandments of the Torah are twofold, spirit and truth. And Messiah came and showed us the true way of spirit and truth. And through prudence they must be fulfilled. For there is a season for a man to embrace his wife, and a season to abstain therefrom for his prayer. Paul talks about the same in some of his letters. And there are the two commandments. Unless they are performed in due order, they leave one open to the greatest sin. It is, is the same with the other commandments. What's the two commandments? I just have a feeling here that Messiah is talking about the two greatest commandments. Loving Yahweh with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving others as ourself. And it says on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while modern day theology may teach this hang be like hanging from a noose in the old wild west and like killing it, um, that's actually not the case at all. When you look at that word, it really means to suspend, uh, suspend from, which is literally like like when you have a coat hanger, your coat hangs from the coat hanger. It's not like choking it out. Like, oh. No, it's like hanging there. Uh, here's a good picture of that. I think I've got a picture here somewhere. I think that is what he's talking about. And we just did a post on um, YouTube uh, community section and Facebook kind of expanding this. Um, I'll pull it up here on YouTube if you want to take a look at it. Um, also, there's something else I want to share with you on the YouTube page. Let's see. Give me just a moment here. Just a moment. Well, we'll wait for that to pull up. No, here we go. So here, we just did a post about this, about the two greatest commandments. So if you want to look at this, we well, here's another kind of visual. Oh. 
of what it really looks like from hangs, all these other commandments. So the Ten Commandments tell us how to love Yah and how to love people, and the Torah really just expands on more details of what that looks like, how to love Yah and how to love people. So anyways, I uh, just wanted to share that with you. And we will finish up the Testament of Naphtali right now. So again, for the commandments of the Torah are twofold and through prudence. What's the word prudence? Let's define the word prudence. I think that might be good for us. The ability to govern and discipl discipline once. Oops. Sorry, something else just popped up. So the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. Skill and good judgment in the use of resources. Caution or circumspection as to danger or risk. I think this is the best one. The ability to govern and discipline oneself by the use of reason. And this is actually the passage I was mentioning earlier too in the Psalms. Psalm 32, 9. Be you not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto you. So we shouldn't be like that animal that constantly needs to be, go here, go here, go here, turn here, this one, turn there. We should have that ruach within us that's guiding us on our daily steps. Of course, again, as we come to a crossroads and we're like, I don't know, of course we seek him. And we can seek him on anything, but... We have to have some discerning discernment within ourselves and some reason. All right, uh, finishing up here, just last couple of verses. Naphtali 8.10. So be wise in Yahuwah and discerning, knowing the order of his commandments, what is appointed for every act so that Yahuwah will love you. We're not going to know everything at once about the Torah, but certainly we can learn as we go and to continue to get refined and pruned. Chapter 9, he gave them many similar instructions, urging them to transfer his bones to Hebron and bury him with his fathers. He ate and drank in soulful glee, covered his face, and died, and his sons acted in accord with the things commanded by their father, Naphtali. So, anyways, uh, that, is the, uh, that is the Testament of Naphtali. I was just going to share with you here. We're going to go over some uh, songs, and some of you have asked in the past, where can you find these songs that we play? Uh, on the front page here, if you scroll down towards the bottom, POTV Music by Simply Prodigal. Also, one of the uh, videos I mentioned earlier was the Beast Unlocked when we were talking about the Beast uh, with seven um, seven uh, heads or crowns and ten horns. Uh, we talk about that here in this video here called Unlocked the Beast of Revelation. So with that, brothers and sisters, we're going to finish up with a, uh, a prayer, then a song, and... Uh, those of you that are still or watching this live, we'll do the tour portion like 10, 15 minutes after this is finished. So let's pray. Father Yah in heaven, we just bless you. The Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We're just thankful for you for sharing truth in these last days, for giving us of your son that we may have hope. And we just ask that you continue to help us, guide our feet, that we neither go to the left or to the right of your ordained way, your commandments, your Torah. Father, we just thank you so much, and we just we yearn for the return of Messiah Yahushua. And until then, just help us to be lights to the nations, Father, and not to, to hide our light under a bushel. We love you so much. In Yahushua's name, amen. All right. Shabbat shalom. And what are we going to play? I don't know. Let's talk about the uh, Ten Commandments. Even though this is a children's song, I think this is a song for all of us. Let's remind ourselves of the Ten Commandments. Shabbat shalom. Let's sing a little song about the two greatest commandments. Loving Yahuwah and loving people. Let's start with how we love Him. You shall not have any other
Blessed are those who keep his way. They may have the right to enter through the gate. Now we're going to sing about loving other people. Here's how. And you shall not murder anyone. And you shall not tell any lies For he sees all who's above the skies You shall not covet anything But keep his ways You will lack a thing Keeping his commandment shows you love him Yahusha did not abolish but strengthen them Say 